All right, thank you very much for the invitation. So um, let me start by giving a brief summary of the paper. Um, in the paper, Rob and the co-authors show that because of investors uh, increasing ESG concerns, green assets should earn lower expected returns than brown assets in theory, in particular in equilibrium. However, in the data, in the past decade or so, green assets actually earn higher expected returns than brown assets. So what gives? Uh, the authors uh, attribute the difference between average realized returns and expected stock returns to abnormal returns. Uh, the abnormal returns can arise from unexpected uh, preference shifts uh, in favor of ESG, and the abnormal returns are not due to higher expected return for green assets. As such, uh, the average abnormal returns are unlikely to persist as argued in the paper. So finally, the paper also argues that the green factor uh, helps explain the recent underperformance of the value premium. So before I uh, present my own perspective, I would like to issue a caveat. Um, although I have spent uh, almost uh, two decades doing asset pricing research and the ESG is actually new to me. Uh, on and off, I have spent about a month working on this discussion, but if you calculate the um, un uninterrupted time, I spend at the most uh, one week. So uh, viewer discretion is advised. Um, in particular, take uh, whatever you can and leave the rest as you wish. Uh, with that said, my perspective is that the green assets are more intangible intensive, green assets are riskier, they are expected to grow faster and should earn higher expected returns than brown assets. Uh, in particular, uh, if this uh, causal uh, mechanism is correct, then there's no need to inv invoke uh, any deviation between average realized returns in the data and expected returns. Uh, in equilibrium. Um, rising intangibles, I have argued elsewhere in my recent work, I have argued that rising intangibles are likely the cause for reason on the performance of the value premium, as well as the outperformance of our expected growth factor. Now, in my discussion, I'm going to try to argue that rising intangibles uh, may also be the cause uh, for the green factor. In other words, uh, rising importance of intangibles is the common cause for all these different uh, symptoms. I have um, assembled the three pieces of evidence underlying my claims. The first piece of evidence is from table one of the paper. So what exactly does ESG uh, measure? So are we talking about ESG or intangibles? Uh, this is table one, uh, more precisely portions of table one. So in which uh, different in industries are sorted on MSCI intangible rankings. The left panel, the left half of this slide reports the top 15 greenest industries. The right half are the brownest. Uh, industries. And if you can uh, stare at the greenest industries, you see these are mostly uh, services and high tech industry, right? The, the greenest industry is asset management industry, um, is our industry. We understand it um, reasonably well, right? So heavy duty human capital uh, intensive, give us a laptop and the internet, we can get work. Right, so it's because the most of the assets are our human capital, knowledge capital, our organizational capital, know-how, professional services, and technical um, uh, telecommunication services. Again, uh, lots of uh, techno technological innovation buried in that industry. Um, healthcare as well, media, interactive media and services, thinking about YouTube, for, YouTube, for example, media and the entertainment industry and this the movies, uh, all these are artistic uh, expressions. They are very intangible, intensive. Pharmaceuticals, again, think about um, Pfizer, Moderna, 
uh, vaccines and or uh, they managed to develop um, highly efficacious vaccines uh, relatively fast, but they were building on decades long earlier scientific knowledge, right? The prior literature that serves as a uh, knowledge capital for them to build on. Um, whereas if you look at the right half of the table, we are looking at the mostly traditional manufacturing industries. These are like all kinds of chemicals, commodity diversified specialty chemicals. We're looking at oil and gas exploration and the production steel industry, uh, mining precious and non-precious metals and mining. Uh, oil and gas refining, construction materials, uh, utility and food products, and also all these are uh, uh, probably less intangible, intensive, and more tangible intensive. So bottom line is that looks like um, from, the, from, the, from the ranking across industries, this seems like prima facie evidence uh, in support of intangibles. Uh, the paper also shows that um, cross-industry variation is much more um, important than within industry variation when it comes to forecasting future uh, average returns at the individual asset level. So the cross-industry variation documented in this table uh, seems to be uh, fairly important. All right, so my second piece of evidence is factor uh, regressions are used to explain the, um, the past the Stempo and uh, Taylor green factor. So Rob in his presentation is using the three factor model and it's delta variant. Uh, that's delta variant is what I call the five factor model and six factor model would be the delta plus variant. So, um, so basically we've been having a three factor pandemic since 1993. So I have to be a bit more forward looking. So I have, I'm gonna take the Pfizer vaccine in the form of the Q factor model and our expected growth factor would be our booster shot. So bottom line is that we're gonna emphasize, I'm gonna emphasize the Q5 uh, factor regression of the green factor, right? The green factor average access uh, return of factor premium uh, is 58 basis points per month and the significant even within that relatively short sample. Uh, CAPM alpha 69 basis points per month, but if you're looking at, uh, if you look at our Q5 factor regression, we only have 30 basis points per month. Uh, that economic magnitude is not exactly small and p-value is only 1.7, I should acknowledge the sample is relatively uh, short. That may have undercut the magnitude of t-value. On the other hand, if you look at our factor loadings, expected growth factor is the most important part uh, that uh, going in the right direction has 20.24 as the factor loading and p-value is 2.7. Uh, in the sample the correlation between our expected growth factor and the green factor is 51%. Um, if you know, it's, if our expected growth factor captures mostly the impact of an intangible investment, and this would be consistent with the prior uh, table, the evidence in table one that I just showed you in the prior slide, right? So to the extent that uh, accountants expense intangible investments away from accounting earnings. As a result, our ROE factor, which is built on accounting earnings, uh, doesn't show up uh, in the sense that its factor loading is very close to zero. Our investment factor goes the wrong way, meaning, but that's okay. It only means that green assets relative to brown assets are investing more, both in terms of intangible investment and tangible investment. All right, so my last piece of evidence is to do the factor spending test in, a, in the other direction. So Rob shows that in the paper that the, the two factor green factor model uh, goes a long way in explaining down the performance of HML. You jump from 71 basis points to 15 basis points and the UMD from 64 to negative eight basis points. And I have managed to replicate um, Rob's estimates to uh, two to three 
uh, digit after the decimal. So, so the numbers are extremely reliable, uh, high quality execution empirical work. So on the other hand, if you use the a green factor model, two factor model to explain our investment factor, uh, because our investment factor doesn't has not underperformed the market as badly as HML. But if you that's the minus uh, twenty one basis points per month, and if you add in the green factor, you shrink that to zero also. So our ROE factor is holding up well, 46 basis points per month, even within that short sample, adding the green factor reduces that uh, by roughly uh, 50% uh, and becomes significant. Most important, our expected growth factor has been doing great and 83 basis points per month, adding the green factor reduces the economic magnitude, magnitude between 40 to 45 uh, percent in terms of fraction of the magnitude. However, the alpha is 47 basis points per month and still remain uh, quite reliable in terms of T value. All right, so let me give a summary of the evidence. Uh, so I put together three pieces of evidence that seem to be pointing to a different uh, causal uh, structure behind the ESG investing. First of all, Green assets seem to be more intangible, intensive than brown assets. And second of all, the Q5 model explains the green factor mostly through the expected growth factor. On the other hand, the green factor model cannot fully capture the expected growth factor. All right, so, so far these are empirical correlations, right? So let me start to uh, think a little bit deeper about causation. So what is the kind of the causal structure um, that is driving, that is um, underlying this layer of uh, reality that we call capital markets, that we call cross-sectional asset pricing? Uh, this is what I have in mind that we have put the put together a empirical uh, Q5 model, right? Um, in which uh, investment factor is constructed as tangible asset growth, not including intangible investment and intangible investment forecast returns with a positive slope, as opposed to tangible investment that forecast returns with a negative slope. However, intangible investment is indeed incorporated in the Q5 model through our expected growth factor. So in, in specifying expected growth, we use Raybo and co-authors operating cash flow as a key predictor, and we have added back R&D expenses into operating cash flow. Right, but we're not including SG&A, um, a portion of which is probably intangible investments. However, based on our uh, reading of the literature, uh, there has not been a reliable empirical procedure uh, for us to separate the current expense component from the intangible investment component of SG&A. So we're not going there empirically just yet. Right in terms of the causal structure, so in my prior work, I have shown that uh, tangible investment seems to be causing the value premium uh, in ongoing work, and we're trying to show that intangible investment causes momentum as well as our expected growth factor, and that could be potentially uh, risky. Think about um, the, the rival vaccine uh, developers, right? They have lost out uh, completely to Pfizer, Moderna, and, um, and the Johnson Johnson, at least in terms of market share in the US. So expected growth may not pan out. Right, so it's only a growth potential. The growth potential may not pan out at the end of the day. So in that sense, expected growth could potentially be risky. All right, so uh, in, in, in the context of this paper, so what is the core causal structure behind the green factor? Right, Rob and co-authors argue, well, well uh, ESG preferences cause lower expected returns for green assets. Uh, in their theory, the green factor should earn negative uh, risk premium. However, in the data, uh, we observe exposed positive um, 
premium, average factor premium for the green minus brown uh, factor. And so what gives uh, Robin co-authors attribute the difference between their theoretical prediction and the empirical data as ex post unexpected shifts in preferences. And they conclude that, so the high positive risk, the high factor premium observed so far for green assets uh, are unlikely to persist going forward. And they also argue that the, the shifts in ESG preferences um, potentially cause the underperformance of the value premium. So my comment would be, and I'm uh, new in the, um, um, philosophical literature on causation, but one concept I've learned recently is the thing called the causal asymmetry, okay, which is a um, property of David Hume's uh, notion of causation. So in terms of temporal order, right, the cause has to happen before the effect. But we know that in our context, the value and the momentum had existed long before ESG became a thing in the past decade. So what was, so what was driving value and the moment, momentum um, in the sample prior to 2010, right? Before ESG um, became a thing. So must be some other causal mechanism, right? So, and, um, and uh, I've argued earlier in the prior slide, the value could be uh, dri driven by tangible investment and, uh, and the intangible investment that may be underlying uh, the momentum uh, factor. So, in, and to the extent that the intangibles have been becoming, uh, have become more important in the past, um, 20 years or so, so, um, so the momentum mechanism becomes more important the relative to the tangible investment mechanism behind the value, so that may be a uh, driving, that may cause the underperformance of the value premium in the past 10, 20 years. Um, so if this mechanism is correct, then rising intangibles may also be causing the higher expected returns for green assets. So if this is a equilibrium factor premium, if that's the case, then the green factor premium will, will likely persist going forward. All right, let me uh, conclude with this old Indian parable about the six blind men and the elephant. The elephant represents the mind independent reality we call capital markets. The six blind men uh, represents uh, all the um, men and women who are trying to, under, well, we are researchers trying to understand the, uh, the mind independent reality from our own unique standpoint. So uh, this is a concept I learned uh, about the open system causation um, from Roy Pascal's critical realism philosophy of science. So we have Rob standing on top of the line, um, thinking about the ESG preference shocks uh, that may be driving the ESG uh, factor. Well, as you have me standing at the end of the line, staring at elephant's butt, uh, been thinking about, hey, maybe and maybe things uh, ESG investing actually has has something to do with rising intangibles. And to the extent that the, the Q5 model has been shown to explain many other uh, factors in the cross section. So my own bias is that standing from my own vantage point, my own prejudice is that that the intangible causal mechanism uh, may be a bit more. Uh, general, a bit more fundamental than the demand-based asset pricing based on shifting um, um, preferences, whereas the supply side asset pricing is based on technology, which presumably a bit more stable and you get to identify exactly who's the marginal supplier of Apple computer. Uh, for example, that's Tim Cook and his management teams, right? Whereas who's the marginal investor? Uh, marginal investors are shifting around all the time. So, all right, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And the bottom line is that, um, and of course, this is just uh, my one blind man's um, uh, opinion. So thank you very much for your attention.